You're in the water loop. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is Travis with Waterloop. I know a lot of people want to use water efficient fixtures, but they're afraid they won't work as well. Let me tell you about High Sierra Shower Heads, which was named Best Shower Head by Popular Science. I just installed one at my house and I was genuinely surprised at the power and coverage of the water. High Sierra Shower Heads earn the EPA Water Sense label for water efficiency. They use at least 40% less water than the conventional low flow shower heads. High Sierra shower heads are constructed out of metal, so there's no plastic involved, they're very durable, and they're naturally antibacterial. One of my favorite things, these shower heads are made in the USA by a small business located in the Sierra Nevada foothills. Get 20% off with promo code WATERLOOP at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. Order today and start saving water and money with High Sierra. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. Welcome to Waterloop. This is Travis. Very excited to be joined by Seth Siegel today. He is uh, the author of this book here, Troubled Water, uh, which I just got through a couple nights ago. Seth, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I just got in late last night from a trip to San Francisco and Los Angeles. I spoke to three different audiences, and I'm really excited, although I'm a little tired today. I'm very excited by the uh, reaction I'm getting. Increasingly, people everywhere who hear this uh, seem to really spark to the fact that we really have to fix our drinking water. Yeah. Well, what what sparked you to write this book? I mean, uh, obviously, there's there's issues you're looking to address, but uh, wh- where did it come from personally, the motivation to write this book? It was kind of, it was kind of an accident um, in a way that <clears throat> I'd written a first book called Let There Be Water, which is about water scarcity, which is an issue that I was thinking about from a geopolitical perspective. And I actually wasn't thinking at all about drinking water. I've n- never thought twice about it. I, I always drink out of the tap and, uh, uh, you know, never gave it a, never gave it a really a second thought, the whole process. I assumed that somebody was out there looking out for me, uh, the EPA or state health officials or somebody was just looking out for me and that they were doing their job. And at, towards the end of the interview with uh, the interview process for actually a couple hundred people I interviewed for Let There Be Water, a professor that I interviewed who I admired very much made mention in passing about the widespread contamination of drinking water everywhere. Mm-hmm. I said, well, I live in New York, not my water. Huh. He said, no, no. He said, when I said everywhere, I meant everywhere. Wow. And then, and then when I went on tour with Let There Be Water, I began thinking, you know, maybe there's a piece there that I need to know more about. So... I wrote him and he sent me a, 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 basically a bookshelf of, of articles and reports and books that I should read. And I started reading them and really devouring them. And that's when I realized that, that this water quality issue was as dire and as important and as underreported and as urgent as the water scarcity issue that I had just spent several years focused on. So I wanted to really, uh, uh, really wanted to play the role as I could of Paul Revere you know, letting people know that there's an issue out there that they have to learn about. It's really shocking given uh, how much water means to people. The fact you take this this liquid and you drink it on a daily basis, right? You give it to your children, your family, your friends. I mean, other the, the air we breathe every second than the water that we drink. Uh, so it's amazing that there wasn't an awareness or is not the level of awareness that there should be. Well, you know, you, you could say yes. You can say yes and no. Let me say what the, the, the let me let me let me balance it in two ways. On on one side, uh, we can say with clarity that people focus on exercise and people make their kids put on their seatbelts and put on helmets when they get on their bikes, and they're careful about what they eat and they don't want the kids to eat fatty food or too much sugar, and yet they don't think twice about opening the tap and drinking from it. That's, that's the one perspective. On the other perspective, the statistics are really very daunting. About 63% of Americans, either exclusively or largely, don't drink tap water anymore. They drink bottled water only, which itself, maybe we'll talk about itself, is not such a, a gift. But, um, but that speaks to a lack of confidence. Now, the bottled water companies would have us believe that people buy bottled water for either convenience or taste. But a Harris poll taken just before I finished writing my book says that 92% of Americans list health or safety, 92% of those who, I'm sorry, not all of Americans, of those 63% who drink primarily bottled water, that 92% of them 
So they do so primarily because of health or safety reasons. So to my, to my mind, that says that we actually do think about it a lot and that Americans, have, what they have done is they've defaulted to a parallel drinking water system. Mm. Now, is it better than tap water? Maybe, maybe not. Is it more expensive? Unbelievably more. And for the amount we're spending on tap water, I'm sorry, on bottled water, we could have we could have everything we want out of the tap water system. Sure, sure. Well, that, that was a really interesting part of your book where you talked about the even the issues with bottled water and which ones have a good source, which ones are filtered, which ones might not be. You know, it's kind of a, a guessing game in large part what's actually in that bottled water. I'm shocked to hear that 92% of people that choose bottled water do it for that safety or health reason rather than the convenience that's that's fascinating well let me give you let me give you a number that'll that'll make no doubt about the issue you ready sixty mm-hmm. percent of all bottled water consumed in the United States is consumed in people's homes Wow and you know what that means that, that means that you are 10 or 15 steps from your kitchen sink if that far and by the way and that's just homes add in people's offices where there's also usually a sink. And then you're talking about the vast majority of the bottled water consumed are not on hiking trails, <laughs> and they're not on car trips. They're mostly consumed where there's a sink. Yeah, that's staggering, staggering stuff. Uh, I want to uh, go to the beginning of your book and ask about your choice to open with Hoosick Falls and what's yep. happened in the community there uh, with PFAS and so forth. Why did you choose to start with that story? Travis, that's a wonderful question, and thank you for it. Um, and it wasn't an accident. I deliberately opened with Hoosick Falls because, for those who read the book Troubled Water, for those who read the book, they'll see that Hoosick Falls is kind of an every person's town. It's a Norman Rockwell American town. It's if those of your listeners and viewers who've seen um, It's a Wonderful Life, you know Bedford Falls, you know the Jimmy Stewart uh, movie that's played every Christmas, um, and. Uh, it, it's a town like that. Everybody knows everybody. Every has everybody. Even the poor people have manicured lawns. <clears throat> you can imagine the little league field. It has, you know, the hand painted ads from local merchants. You know, it's just it's the all American place. And everybody there kind of assumed that their water was just fine. And it turned out that the water was contaminated and had been contaminated for quite a while, and that people in the town were getting sick kidney cancer, testicular cancer, ulcerative colitis, high blood pressure for pregnant women, and other, other really dire ailments. Nobody there could figure it out. There was one doctor in town, no scientists really. And this one everyman, not a science major in college, never, take, t- t- never had taken a science course in his life other than high school. He figured it out. Mm. And when he tried to raise the alarm, <clears throat> he went to the mayor of the town and said, you know, we have this problem here. And the mayor's reaction was, what are you making trouble for? Mm. Wow. And, that, and that is, in a sense, the story of America's water, mm. is that water everywhere, it may not be as contaminated as Hoosick Falls, though many places are. It may not always lead to the same dire health consequences, although in many places it does. But generally speaking, our elected officials who are there to protect us aren't doing so. The, the, so that's the Hoosick Falls story. I, I want to add another image that I that I just actually used yesterday when I was speaking sure. uh, to a group. And that is, I said that if we were to walk into our local public park and a third of the benches were broken and a third of the trees had, had been cut down and a third of the baseball fields had been ripped up, likewise, if you want in your kid's classroom, a third of the seats were broken, you would call the the local officials. Well, that's the story we have in America today. About a third or more of our infrastructure is already broken. Much more of it is in the pipeline. And we are not adequately addressing the problems in front of us. We have health problems. We have infrastructure problems. We have have problems of, of modernizing our facilities. And we are not taking it seriously because it's out of sight, out of mind. And mayors and city councils and our elected officials generally are not taking this on. And my goal is to raise an alarm so that people get agitated. Use the book if you want. My book is a, is a tool for learning about it or not. I don't care. But get smarter about water and start demanding better drinking water. And we're going to have it if we do demand it. I like that point you made about Hoosick Falls being kind of an every town in America and people in every town in America think, oh, that's not my community. This won't happen here. My water's fine. But that's not not really the case. Um, What are your thoughts, just kind of on a related note, because of PFAS, on uh, a movie like Dark Waters coming out and and the story it tells and the impact it could have? 
Well, I'm appreciative to Mark Ruffalo and to the directors uh, and producers of the film, director and producers of the film, <clears throat> that they decided to highlight this important story. Anything that helps raise awareness of PFAS or of other water contaminants is a, is a public service. I would say that uh, I, I suppose that the, the problem is always that when you ever you're doing a Hollywood production, it's going to have a little more hype, a little more drama, you know, than you might otherwise have. And, and I suppose I'm more of a documentary guy than a feature film guy, maybe. But but and, and the reason I say that is that I don't want people to dismiss the threat. I don't want people to say, oh, it's just a movie or, oh, it's just that town in West Virginia. I want people to understand that that, in fact, the contamination with PFAS is, is you know, there are 7,800 chemicals that fall into the PFAS family, and and that we believe, uh, we scientists believe that there, that about 98 percent of Americans have one PFAS chemical or another, or sometimes several, in their bloodstream. Mm. So I think it's valuable that we're talking about it. I just wish that that it wasn't presented in a way that people would say, "Oh, it's just a bunch of hype," or "It's just Hollywood." It's fiction, right? No, it's actually it, that's not. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, just for for your information, I live in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, and so we have Gen X uh, that was been put in the Cape Fear River here for forty years by Kimors, uh, a Dupont subsidiary. Yes. And so uh, you know, this community is very much living living through this kind of situation here. And it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, I want to, I want to switch to something that I think is really a question I've grappled with and you hit on it really well here. And it's the idea with, with chemicals and should they be guilty until proven innocent or should they be innocent until proven guilty? Uh, in the U S we have this system where they are basically innocent until proven guilty. I think in Europe, they take the opposite approach. Um, and I, I'm, personally baffled by that. I feel like it should be uh, proved that these are okay, at what level they're okay, before you get to use them and spread them throughout our environment and throughout our water. Um, your thoughts on this this approach to how we handle chemicals in water? Well, I have, again, I, I, you know, I'm not a doctrinaire guy. I'm extremely pragmatic in my approach here. And I, I, I have one of two approaches. I say, on the one hand, either we have to test these chemicals before they're put into commerce, in the same way that we test our drugs by the FDA, and we should know if these if these re pharmaceutical residues and other chemicals are getting into our water, what effect it's going to have on our bodies. That's one that's one approach, and that's fine. I'm happy with that. It's called the precautionary principle. I'm happy with that, but I'm also equally happy with not doing any testing and letting the chemical companies run amok. But with here's the proviso that our wastewater systems have to clean the water before it's put into nature. And our drinking water systems have to do more than a little dab of chlorine. That's where I'm coming from. I, 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 I'm happy. Again, I'm not a doctrinaire guy. All I want to have, and the effect of, of my book, all I want out of it is that the largest number of people possible get the healthiest, cleanest, safest water possible at the cheapest price possible. That's what my goal is. And I'm in, you know, no one's employed, not the chemical companies, not the utilities, nobody. But uh, um, so, but, but so what I'm passionate about is that outcome. But how we get there, there's more than one road to get there. And, and so where people say, well, we should test every chemical, you know, that would slow the economy down. OK, that, but that might be right, because then you'll have fewer sick people and fewer, fewer societal problems on that side of the equation or on the other side. Just say we're going to spend the little bit, not a lot of extra money we need to spend to upgrade our wastewater treatment plans from using technologies that are 100 years old and our drinking water using technologies that are 100 years old. It makes no sense. There's nothing else in our American society that is still using technology as it's, or in the main using technology that's 100 years old. We just don't do that. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, technology now is just a couple of years old. It's rolled out and used right away. Sure. Uh, science. So I'm curious on, on your thoughts on uh, how science has allowed us to detect things at su such a lower and lower threshold. And then the question of, well, does presence mean threat? You know, just because something is there, is it a health concern? And then the other part of that, the slow process for evaluating if something is a health risk. There's a lot in there's a lot in that, but I, I, I said, yes. you know where I'm going. I was just I was just gonna, I suddenly had a flashback to my career a long time ago as a as a lawyer, and I remember when somebody would ask a question like that, there would always be objection, compound question. <laughs> we maybe we can break it into a couple of parts. 
and 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 uh, you know because each one of them has its own complexity. Sure. Um, but 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 what I can start by saying is that um, is that chemicals in America have helped drive our economy and helped drive our society, and we've had great outcomes as a result of that. And I am absolutely not an anti-business person. I actually believe that business is going to play a very large part in solving our problems. I mean, there's an irony, by the way, about the movie Dark Waters, which is that now DuPont is a very different company today than it was, you know, when all this uh, all this uh, PFOA stuff was starting. But but um, the irony is is that they make a very good filter that it can be used to filter out PFOA. Now, I, I, it happens to be that it was a company that they acquired. It's a, more of a coincidence than not a coincidence. They got into a new line of work. But, but I think that we can be candid about this and say that, that, that business has the yeah, potential to be a very big saving grace for us in our society, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I definitely want to move on to a couple other areas that are big, big, big points in your book about why uh, you, you think why we have this troubled water and that's utilities, uh, and how utilities function and how they view themselves. Uh, could you talk about that? Yeah. So the one thing that, that, you know, I've been speaking pretty widely, the book is out just a few months and I've already spoken to more than 60 audiences. And I think that there are a handful of things that always make the audiences uh, not figuratively, but literally jaws drop, you know, audiences go, ah, oh, I can't believe this kind of thing. And, and, and one of those is, is the stat, status of, of drinking water utilities in the United States. And I always pose it this way. I always tease the audience as I say, okay, let's, let's play a little game here. Let's assume that every, that there are 50 states, of course, let's assume that every state has at least one drinking water utility. But I want you to guess the real number I always say to the audience. How, how many water systems do we have? And what do you think would be a rational number for that? Mm. So if we wanted to have an efficient system, how many would we have? So audiences, you know, we'll say 150, 200, you know, it's sort of like a, an auction almost, you know. <laughs> but Travis, I've never had an audience get higher than number 700. Wow. That's the highest because nothing above that makes any sense. Right. And so then, then I say, okay, okay, let's, let's, and then, and then I'll usually, if I, if I'm ha really having fun with the audience, you know, I'll say, I'll say, he said, said, or she said 700. How many of you think that that's even possible? And like, like laughter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I say to the person who said, do you want to, want to change that number? Okay. 500. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. And then I say it's 51,535. <laughs> yeah. And, and audience, audiences, that's when the draws drop. Yeah. And, and so, and so the story is, is that I am not opposed to, uh, many drinking water utilities. That's not what my concern is. If if, the, if we can deliver water universally in a very effective way with small utilities, I'd have no problem. The problem is that the smaller the utility, the more likely you are. Not universally. There are some excellently run ones that have no history of health violations. So not everyone is bad and by no means. But on average, statistically, the smaller you are, the more likely you are to have self-reported health violations of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Okay, so start with that. But even those who have never had a violation, very few of the small ones could say that they have adequate funds to modernize their to modernize their technology, to hire all the staff they would like to have, and to fix broken uh, infrastructure. So as a result of that, I make the argument that anything that we can do that can get us to a point where these utilities are better financed we will have a better health outcome for America, provided that they use that financing in the proper way, which is not to necessarily, if it's a private or investor owned utility, not to just simply take it as profits. And if it's a, a public utility, not to take that extra money that they could possibly be getting from the larger uh, uh, catchment area to put money into the municipal budget. Water fees and sewage fees should be used for those specifically. I believe strongly that water is underpriced in most of America. And the result of which is because we don't have leadership from mayors and city councils who see rate increases, water rate increases, as akin to a tax. And they don't want to be in the business of, of levying taxes because it makes them unpopular with voters. Mm. So we're in a vicious circle. So that's why I call in my book for having less involvement by mayors and city councils in, in water and sitting, setting water prices. And I definitely think that, the, that by, by consolidating, and not just I think, we know, we see it that when they consolidate, you get better outcomes, better technology, better staffing, better fixing of infrastructure. Uh, this consolidation idea, what would be a, a number that might make more sense in your mind? 
well, look, we're not going to go from 50 some odd thousand down to, uh, you know, under a thousand in any time soon. But here's what I would say. I would say that we have many, many utilities that have health violations, meaning that they, that they violate of the contaminants, and it's not a large enough number, but of the contaminants that the EPA has identified as truly dangerous for our health. It's only 70 chemicals and a total of 91 contaminants, including those 70. So you have a very small number. Of those, you still have many, 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 many thousands of utilities every year who are in violation. And you have several thousand who have been in violation for five years or longer. So I would start, the Siegel plan would start by saying, okay, we're going to do the following. Either you're going to pay a fine for your being in violation for more than three years or four years or five years, you can pick the number because you can't poison your public forever and get away with it. So either you pay a fine or you begin the process of consolidating or merging and or being acquired. And I, I would say to each of these facilities, either you get fined or you have three years from the date that we, you know, is the go switch goes on to merge or, or, or consolidate or be acquired, or you have to start paying a fines or the EPA will take some action. So right there, you're going to bring down the number by many thousands. But I think we should also be providing economic incentives to, to localities to, to merge or consolidate or be acquired. Because what I hear in my interviews is a lot of mayors say, you know, this is a source of local pride or it's a source of local jobs. And, and therefore, we need to find other ways of providing that local pride or, or those local jobs and not do it at the cost or the expense of the health of your community. Mm, absolutely. So uh, let's turn to another huge part of your book, and that's the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, you go into great detail, just fascinating detail, very insightful, uh, insightful chapters and text here on what the issues are. Um, so, but what what would you give as a summary as to the problem with uh, problems with EPA, the problems with the Safe Drinking Water Act that are holding back drinking water quality in America? Okay, so here's what I think is the original sin, if I can mix uh, a metaphor. And, and that is that um, I don't think that drinking water should ever have been put under the control of the EPA. I think that what happened was, and I trace the history of this a little bit in the book, is that what happened was that there had been efforts to pass something akin to the Safe Drinking Water Act for several years. And it never got out of committee because large interests had no interest in having water regulated in the way that it has come to be regulated or at all. Um, they, they were happy with the self-regulating mechanism and, and sort of leave us alone. And then there was this national scare over drinking water. And almost overnight, the Safe Drinking Water Act gets out of committee, gets onto a floor vote and gets signed into law by President Gerald Ford. And because of the fact, and this is in 1974, because of the fact that two years earlier, the Clean Water Act, which is about sewage discharges into public waterways, was appropriately put into the EPA. And I think Congress was, I don't know, either lazy or, or I don't really, I couldn't find the legislative history on this, mm. but they were simply mistaken that the drinking water should not have been seen as an environmental issue. But what they did was they said, oh, well, that's water and this is water and there is a correlation of some kind between sewage and drinking water. So we'll just put it all into this newly formed EPA, which is only in business since 1970. Mm. And in the early years, the EPA was a great organization, um, uh, at least by intent. And it still does many important things. And I hasten to add, I, I know that there are whole large numbers of EPA uh, uh, officials who are upset by my book. And I, I don't mean to upset anybody. I think they do a very, they work hard. They try to do well. They're very smart. They're very experienced. There are excellent people working at the EPA. And I'm not pointing a finger at anyone in particular. I'm, I'm pointing a finger at a broken system. What we have is, is a system that should be focusing water as a public health issue and not as an environmental issue. First of all, you would clean up the problem of many Republicans who sort of by allergy don't want to be involved in what they think of as an environmental issue, let it become a public health issue, it's less controversial. And in addition, in addition, you have an opportunity to do much more testing and to focus this on much more on science and much less on the economics around water, which is, are we gonna upset the uh, water utilities? Are we gonna upset the big trade associations in the industry? And, uh, and, and that's what we need to do. We need to change the focus. Now, if we are to stay at the EPA, 
which I still not sure is a good idea, but if we are to stay at the EPA, fine, then let Congress do what it, it wanted to do in 1985 and 1986 with the first round of amendments to the Safe Drinking Water Act. Let them create a regimen whereby the EPA has all the funding that it needs. Yeah. I, <clears throat> Safe Drinking Water Act, you know, there were the 96 amendments, and I am always been staggered by the fact that there's been no new regulated contaminants in 24 years. Uh, and I, you go into that in the book. I'll let you articulate that instead of instead of myself going on about it. So uh, explain to people how that is possible and why <laughs> there has been no new contaminants, you know, federal standards in, in 24 years. Well, Travis, this is an uncommonly high level uh, conversation. I, I, I th can't thank you enough for it. And, and uh, you know, I've done I don't know. I've lost count of how many radio interviews, TV and uh, podcast interviews I've done. So I really want to thank you for this. And sure. I, I suspect you have a very high, high level, uh, uh, a very informed listener uh, and viewership here. So so uh, hopefully this is the start of many conversations we'll have on this topic. Look forward to it. Uh, but but the, 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 the problem with the Safe Drinking Water Act is basically is what you put your finger on is the 96 amendments. What it did was it, it changed the process for regulating a contaminant. And what it, you created this this sort of this triple standard that that uh, every contaminant has to le leap through, and it has to be proven that it's a threat to public health. It has to be proven that it's, uh, it has widespread effect. It has to be proven that you can meaningfully change the profile by by regulating it. And then you have the process then of having to set what this what the regulatory standard should be. What's called the maximum contaminant level, and and as a result of that, you've gummed up the works. And you've turned this into a political process instead of a scientific or medical process. So it's it's now I, and I will also say that it wouldn't surprise me if the Trump administration does regulate, you know, PFAS or does regulate perchlorate or some other long, long, long standing chemicals that have been under review for, as you put it, 20, 23, 24 years. But the problem is going to be, I fear that they're going to regulate it at a very high MCL because it's going to again do that for economic reasons. So it'll be set high enough that it'll affect few, if any, utilities. And everybody will, everybody will, everybody except the public health will be well served. Mm. And so, and so that's the problem that we have. The last thing I'll say is, is that there's a lot of people who would like, who believe that, you know, after 96, there was no possibility for the EPA to do anything. And that's where I disagree. And if I can find fault with the EPA, but by the way, and I hasten to add, a lot of people assume that, you know, well, Trump is bad on this and Trump is bad on that. And therefore, he must be bad on drinking water. And he may be, he may not be. I don't know. But what I can say is that this is a bipartisan failure and that there's no difference when when there was a Democrat in the White House and Democratic control of both houses of Congress, when they could have had a run of the table on this. They chose not to do anything. And that's the dirty little secret about drinking water in America is that that's the dirty little secret about drinking water in America is that nobody seems to understand that that this is a bipartisan failure. We really need to fix this in a bipartisan way. So what I, I, just the last word on this uh, is to say that the Safe Drinking Water Act provides enough tools, even with the amendments, for the EPA to do lots of things that they choose not to do. And I think the reason has become that they're a little bit shell-shocked. They're afraid of coming under attack. They are afraid of having their budgets further cut. And so they frequently on terms of drinking water, I can't speak about any other area the EPA does work in, but vis-a-vis -vis drinking water, they tend to play it safe. And one person who was one of the most insightful people I interviewed of the nearly hundred I interviewed for the book is a former very senior EPA official. And, I, and he was in, in a democratic administration and um, he won't let me identify him any further than this. I can't say what department or whatever, or what level uh, at the EPA. But what he said to me was, is that, is that you know, we're, we're resource constrained and we're not prepared to take on political battles. And therefore, he says, there are enough things that can kill you quickly, like cholera, that we spend our energies focusing on rather than things that can kill you slowly. So, so the PFAS and the things that create all kinds of other endocrine disrupting compounds that get into our water, like uh, pharmaceutical residues, get shunted off to the side for hoping for a better day or waiting, I suspect, what my point is, 
waiting until there's a popular up- uprising about this and that people start demanding it. And once they do, by the way, once they start demanding it, it'll come very quickly. Change. Sure. Then they, then you have the political will that you need to, to make these changes. Like you said, there's a lot of politics involved here for sure. Um, and just, just for some, some background, I, um, I did work at EPA for eight years, six of those years as the communications director for the Office of Water. So uh, I was there when Hoosick Falls emerged. I was there when Flint happened. Um, and I appreciate what you said about uh, this being a, a lot of it being a failure of the system. And uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, I, I can see how the gridlock is there. Um, and I, it's tough. I mean, it was, it was some tough stuff for me to read in your book because I... Uh, know so many of the people at EPA and so many of them, their hearts and their minds and their work are really in the right place. They come in every day con- sure. concerned about I public agree. health, you know, and really, really do. And it means a lot to them, but uh, it's a, it's a tough system right now. Um, I want to move on in the By le- the way, can we, can we, can we, before we jump, can I just take a split second yeah. to say that, you, that we have not talked about the third leg of the, of the Safe Drinking Water Act triad which is, of course, there's the utility, which has every incentive to keep costs down. And there's the EPA, which has every incentive to not get in trouble with Congress. But the third leg is the state. The state is the, is the party, except for one state in, in D.C., except for I think, Wyoming and D.C. Um, every other state is the interface between the EPA and the, and the utility. And there also there's a failure because of the fact that so many of these utilities are controlled by mayors. And because the process is so incredibly politicized that governors do not want to get into a position of, even if it's the other party, governors do not want to get into the position of, 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 of embarrassing local officials. And they don't want to set off problems. Again, we're back to the Husik Falls model. They don't want to set off problems. And so, and so we're faced with a problem where, where a key gatekeeper, a key guardian in the state health and environmental bodies are also not doing their proper job. And the only time it comes that people come alive is when suddenly there's something that's a p- career ending move, like a, like a Flint and in Hoosick Falls, you know, there were complaints about PFOA for a long time mm. before the state jumped in. And, you know, I, 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 I've, I've only met uh, Andrew Cuomo once and it was many, many years ago, so I can't speak to his motivations, but it wasn't until Flint came about that he jumped in and made sure that water is better. And, that, that, and thank God for all the good things he's done since. I mean, whatever the motivation is, I appreciate it. But, the, but, but it was not until there was a fear factor thrown into the highest echelons. It doesn't organically happen that they're fixing, they're, they're doing their part of the equation either. Okay, I'm sorry, but go back to no, where you are. No, that's a great point about the states because they also have a lot of ability to do things on drinking water that you know that yes. they don't have to just strictly depend on EPA. They can get out there and they can set their own standards and limits. And you see that happening in places with PFAS right now. So, And one of the problems with the, I believe, generally too low MCLs, um, or I'm sorry, too high MCLs, that the MCLs are not set low enough generally, and also the fact that there aren't enough contaminants that are regulated altogether. The other problem about this is that we have a situation that mayors and governors and state officials can lean on the EPA, rely on the EPA to the public and say, hey, we're in compliance with the EPA standards. So I, I'm thinking of printing up T-shirts or bumper stickers that says, you know, legal does not necessarily equal safe. Mm. Mm. Not really, not really. By the way, <laughs> no. But if you want to go, if you want to go to business with me, Travis, there, we'll do it together. There you go. There you go. I like that. Uh, <laughs> in in the last few minutes that we have together, I want to just rapid fire through some of the solutions. We, you've touched okay. you've touched on a number of them. Uh, you said consolidate utilities, right? That's a that's a big step. Uh, you said move drinking water to health and human services. Move it out yep. of the EPA. Uh, a couple other ones is make a tech not oh, make a tech. We, yeah. we also we also said that pricing has to be real world. It has to be has to be set to, to get the best outcomes. Sure. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Your... Yeah, it's okay. So uh, technology make, make a technology leap. Uh, what what yep. solution do we need to make there? Well, you need more money first of all, and you need to have a new orientation. So the good enough is is not good enough is not good enough anymore. And it, if it ain't broke, don't if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mentality that governs in so many utilities has to be changed. We have to be proactive, and un, because we understand that the technologies exist. You, you know, in that, in that ultra, ultra compound question that you asked before that I didn't answer, <laughs> it was about the technology. Yeah. We have the tools now to measure down to the very smallest volumes and concentrations. And so the falseness that we had previously was, oh, it's just a teeny amount. 
Yeah, but now we know that even those teeny amounts can cause very large medical mayhem. So that's what we need to do. We need to protect ourselves with technology, whether it's the measurement or whether it's the technology that can remove the bad guys from our water. Yeah, we have the technology to produce pure water. You go into it in the book, you know, what they've got in Orange County. So we need to get this in place in a lot more, a lot more locations or everywhere. Another, yeah. another solution that you offer is uh, establish an improvement fund. What's your solution there? Yeah, look, I, I, I believe that we need to uh, find greater sources of funding. So the thought I had was that maybe there'd be a national tax of a penny per thousand gallons or a penny for, for every, there was seven, last year there was 70 billion, 70 billion, it's hard to fathom that, 70 billion individual drinking water containers sold in the United States. If there was as little as a two penny tax, not levied at the retail, but levied at the production of the, of the bottles where people had to keep track of it and once a quarter, once a year, send in a check, that would generate $1.4 billion for new funding for research. And I am told by scientists that that amount of money would transform our understanding of drinking water and would also bring all kinds of really talented chemists who are out there already into the world of testing for water. And we could have a much better outcome with, with as little as $1.4 billion. So if the feds aren't gonna fund it and keep it in a lockbox so that it doesn't get disrupted, this gives us an opportunity to have a new funding source. Sure. Another solution, amend the amendments. So if you had the pen in Congress, uh, what, what were some of the key changes you would make? Well, first of all is I would, um, I would have a more proactive EPA. And one of the ways that they're kept from being more proactive is that they're limited at researching more than, uh, I think it's 25 or 15, 25 it is, um, contaminants in any three-year period. And it seems to me that that's an artificial break on the system. The second thing is that the consumers can't know what's going on because they have this consumer confidence report they get once a year that is such gobbledygook. I mean, I'm a water person and I'm a lawyer <laughs> and, you know, and, and I'm a relatively, you know, well, I have a relatively good vocabulary, yeah. you know, and, I'm, and, and, you know, and I've spent 10 years working in water and I still can't decipher my annual uh, consumer confidence report. So I would, I would make that obligatory that we have a better set. And a couple other things. I think we have a system now where only large communities are tested for second tier contaminants. That's how, that's how PFOA persisted for so long in the drinking water of Hoosick Falls. We knew, from in the, we knew from 20 years plus earlier in West Virginia, that's the story of dark waters, that there was a, that there was a PFOA problem. Why wouldn't the EPA take it upon itself to say that instead of random testing in small communities, they were going to proactively test for PFOA in any manufacturing town that's using any part of the chain of, of, of PFOA chemicals? How, why would you do that? Yeah. So, 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 and, the, and the town is so small and the utility is so small, again, referencing the other comments we've made, they're not going to go out and test it on their own. They wouldn't even think to test it on their own with that direction. So you, you're in a vicious circle of inactivity. So I would make a more proactive EPA would be the most important thing I would do as a, as a guidance from a changing of 1996 uh, uh, amendments. And a, another solution that you put out there that ties into what you kind of said there is ending the honor system for testing. Yeah, testing right now is a corrupt system in America, or it's an invitation to dishonesty. It's certainly an invitation to um, incompetence. And we should, we should not rely upon the utilities to test. It turns out, whether it's chemicals, or whether it's pharmaceuticals, or whether it's uh, lead in the water, that, that we have very large incentives to, to game the system. Uh, it's a very well-known story told uh, by Environmental Working Group that um, that they did a large test along the Mississippi River, many, many cities and towns along the Mississippi River. And what they discovered was that the utilities were testing the water the day before the, the seasonal spraying was done. So guess what? Atrazine and the other pesticides were not found in the drinking water. Mm. So what they did was they did the test not at the lowest possible point, but at the highest possible point. They did it two days after the spraying. And lo and behold, almost everybody had way, way above uh, MCL approved levels in their, of, of, of atrazine in their, in their drinking water. Well, let's fix that. Mm. So, and, and in terms of uh, having an honor system where the towns report to the state and the state then reports to the EPA, let, let's also fix that. And there's enough smart people out there 
who can be trained, uh, school teachers, science teachers, whatever, in communities, to be doing the testing. I don't think we, we need to have an honor system that is so frequently dishonored. You, you don't want to have a system that can lead to fraud and abuse, especially when you have no punishment for that fraud and abuse. Sure. And the last solution, just to, to reference, uh, you know, you've, we've talked about funding. You've talked about setting up an improvement fund. We've talked about the cost of all, all this technology and infrastructure. Uh, one of the solutions you put out there is is vouchers, water vouchers for the poor. Yeah. So we are a, a, we are or should be a compassionate society. Say it says about 15 million Americans have their drinking water shut off every year for non-payment, and that's a very large number. Now some of them get it reconnected within a, a few days or a few weeks, but some don't. And it's humiliating, and it, you can't live your life as a member of society if you can't prepare food, and you can't you can't t- t- drinking water, and certainly if you can't bathe. So I believe that in the same way we have, uh, I know they've changed the name, but in the same way we used to have food stamps, and the same way we have clothing vouchers, and we have housing allowances. And frankly, the same way that when I went to college, because I came from a family that couldn't afford it, I got a scholarship. We, we subsidize education, we subsidize healthcare, we subsidize all kinds of things. Let's also make sure that nobody ever has their water shut off for inability to pay. Yeah, terrific. Well, Seth, I really uh, appreciate your time. I appreciate the conversation. It's a terrific, terrific book that I really encourage anybody that's in water, they have to read it. It's a must read, and hopefully people outside of water will, will read it as well. Uh, and again, I appreciate your time, and, and I'd, love to, uh, I'd love to chat some time about Israel and uh, kind of their, what's going on with water there. Yeah. So it's really in the driest place in the world. They're really kind of a model for the world. I'd love to do that too, as well. By the way, your last words about it's a must read for everybody in water. Feel free to go to the Amazon page and uh, and, <laughs> and and put that as your review because that that's exactly what I'm trying to say. I would also, by the way, thank you so much, Travis. I know you follow me on Twitter at, at Seth M. Siegel. And um, I, I love following you back as well. So I hope we can continue to build a body of, of interested water people, because the more we talk about water, even when it's uncomfortable, we're going to have much better water outcomes. All right. I appreciate it. I'm going to go on Amazon when I hang up here, and we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Seth. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Waterloop, Waterloop, Waterloop. The Waterloop podcast is sponsored by High Sierra Showerheads, the smart, stylish choice for conserving water, energy, and money while enjoying an invigorating shower. Use promo code WATERLOOP for 20% off at HighSierraShowerHeads.com. You're in the Waterloop. Waterloop.